Well, good God bless everybody. So glad that you're with us tonight. As we say every Tuesday, this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So glad to see each and every one of you on tonight. We are getting ready to have a great time in the Lord. I am telling you, for the last few weeks, the last month or so, we've been dealing with living under an open heaven. How to live under an open heaven. Want to say good God bless you to everyone that's tuned in tonight. And as you come on, as we ask you to do on every Bible study, click like and share. Can you do that for me? Click like and share. Get somebody else in the service. Oh, I'm telling you, we're going to have a great time in the Lord. And the more people we get on tonight, the more of a better time that we will have. We're going to learn, learn, learn. You're going to need your Bibles. You're going to need a notepad. You're going to need anything that you take notes with. Get it in your hand because we're going to have a good time in the Lord. I want to say good evening here to uh, Brother Dwight all the way from Florida. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Sister Myra, thank you for being with us tonight. Who else do we have? I need some more people to come on. We're just going to give it a few more moments as people come on tonight so we can get an understanding. The word says in all of our getting to get a what? An understanding. And as I say every week, it's time for us not only to be a shouting church, it's time for us to start being a thinking church. God wants us to take dominion, rulership, and reign in the kingdom on the earth realm right now. Not in the sweet by and by, not when that great getting up morning comes. Right now, God wants us to take rulership and reign and authority in the earth realm. How many would do that? Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. We're going to pray. And as people come on, just announce yourself. Let me know where you're watching from, who you are. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for tagging people there, Brother Dwight. Keep on tagging people. Thank you for that. Share, share, share. Do that for me. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you right now for your grace and mercy. Thank you tonight for this opportunity to come into this place and study and rightly divide the word of truth. Now, God, we're thanking you for another day of life, health, and strength. We thank you, God, for waking us up this morning, clothing us in our right mind. We thank you, God, that we have the activity of our limbs. God, we just lift our hands and we say thank you. Some are lying in a hospital room. Some, God, are lying unconscious, not knowing where they are. But we thank you, God, that we have life, health, and strength in our bodies, and we are able to get a word from you tonight. Now, God, we're asking that you would heal the sick. Someone watching tonight that may be afflicted in their body. You said in your word, by your stripes, we are healed. We are made whole. Father, right now we're praying for the bereaved family. So many have lost loved ones, God. I have close friends and family members who've lost people. God, I'm asking that you would comfort, comfort them right now in this hour of bereavement. But most of all, God, open up our eyes, open up our ears, Open up our spiritual intellect tonight that we may get an understanding of your word. We thank you right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God and amen. All right. Good God bless everybody. Amen. And we're going to jump right into the lesson tonight. Got a lot to cover, so I'm not going to go through a lot of preliminaries for those who are still coming on. If you're tuned in for the first time, you're watching the Bible study or the Bible forum for the Life Transformation Church. I am Pastor Tim, pastor of that church, and we're so delighted that you will spend your Tuesday evening with us. Good evening, Zynga. God bless you. Thank you for being here. I also enjoyed your Bible study the other night, Zynga. Great job. Listen, uh, the God has given us the tool. God is giving us Facebook. He's giving us Instagram, all these platforms that we can use to build up the kingdom of God. We don't have these things to put out a bunch of foolishness, but we have these things to build the kingdom of God. Brother Sam, God bless you, man. Thank you for being with us tonight. 
All right, let's jump right into the lesson. We've been talking about living under an open heaven. And as I remind you, just because you are saved, just because you can shout a little bit, just because you can speak in a tongue or two, just because you've been baptized does not necessarily mean that you are living under an open heaven on a continuum. Listen, God wants you to enjoy life and enjoy it more abundantly. The word says he came that we may have life and have it what? More abundantly. And I want to let you know if Jesus Christ had to come under an open heaven before he can do any miracle signs and wonders, so do we. So the question is tonight, how do I enjoy this open heaven? How do I live under an open heaven perpetually every day of my life? I want to let you know how and how you do that is through obedience. How you do that is being obedient to the voice of God and doing exactly what he told you to do. Our key scripture has been for the last few weeks found in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. And as I say every week, don't you dare panic. We're not going to talk about tithes and offerings. That is not our plot or our lot tonight. It's to talk about tithe and offering. But I want to read it to you so it can give you an understanding. The Bible says in Malachi 3 and 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food or meat in my house. And prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. Okay, put a pin in that. If I will not open for you, the windows of heaven. Now, I remind you, you cannot open the windows of heaven on your own merit. No, God opens the windows. They are his windows, and he's the only one that has the authority to open those windows on your behalf. The Bible says, and pour you out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. All right? God wants to pour you out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. So we also studied, and just to give you the catch up, okay, if God is pouring this blessing out, what is the blessing? If God is opening up the windows of heaven, it takes several to pour out one blessing, what is that blessing? That blessing, I remind you, is to be empowered through revelation knowledge to prosper. You want to write that down. It means to be empowered through revelation knowledge to prosper. Okay? I want everybody to shout this with me or put it in the comments. I have power to prosper. Okay? I have power to prosper. Sister Deanna, God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight. I have the power to prosper. And what does that mean? That means when I come under this open heaven, my life now is transmogrified. When I come under this open heaven, the old folks would say, uh, I looked at my hands and my hand looked new, looked down at my feet and my feet did too. But when I really come under that open heaven, it simply means there is nothing broken or nothing missing in my life, speaking of the totality of my life, from my head to my toe, to my help, through my finances, my family, my relationships, there is nothing missing in my life, and there is nothing broken when I finally come under that open heaven. Can you say hallelujah tonight? All right, so let me remind you how the heavens open for Jesus Christ. And I'm just going back through the last three weeks in the next five minutes to give you a synopsis on what we've talked about. You remember when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, the Bible says all the people gathered together with John the Baptist and Jesus also was baptized. When he was baptized, he also prayed. And when he went down in the water, three, a, a few things happened. Three things happened. When he went down in the water and came up, the Bible says 
the Holy Ghost descended as a dove. So the first thing that will happen in your life to prove to you that you're living under an open heaven, the Holy Ghost now communes with you. I'm not talking about a shout. I'm not talking about a, a, a tongue. I'm not talking about a high praise. I'm not talking about an emotional feeling. I am talking about knowing that the Holy Ghost is ruling and reigning in your life. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost, which is our keeper, keeps you from doing things that you used to do. Second thing that happened when Jesus was baptized, the Bible says a voice from heaven cried out. A voice from heaven cried out. So therefore, the next thing that you will learn to prove that you are living under an open heaven, you clearly now hear and recognize the voice of God. You clearly now can decipher between your voice and his voice. Because a lot of things that we say the Lord said, <laughs> he hadn't said. Because it's simply our emotions. Because we don't know his voice. The word said, my sheep know my voice. And a stranger's voice they will not follow. So when you are living under an open heaven, point number two, you'll start recognizing the voice of God. The third thing that's going to happen in your life to prove that you're living under an open heaven, just like it did for Jesus, the Father pronounced the blessing. What did the, God the Father say over God the Son? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I remind you that Jesus hadn't done anything. So how in the world can the father be pleased in the son when Jesus Christ hadn't healed the sick? He hadn't raised the dead. He hadn't given sight to the blinded eye, not because he could not have, because he was following the rules and the order of the law that was already laid out. And in that time, Jewish custom said that you were not mature enough to handle the things of God until you were 30 years old. Does that mean that we have to be 30 years old now? No, it doesn't mean that. It simply means we have to come into spiritual maturity. So Jesus Christ came into spiritual maturity and the father now pronounces the blessing over his life. Can you say hallelujah? Are you getting this tonight? Are y'all getting this tonight? All right, all right, this is good. Again, I'm playing catch up. We're gonna get in the lesson in just a few. All right, there are four prerequisites to this open heaven. There are four prerequisites into the blessing of sonship. And to live under an open heaven simply means that you are enjoying the blessing of sonship. Prerequisite number one, you must repent. Repent does not mean that you ask God to forgive you and you have plans to do the same thing tomorrow. No, repentance means you are turning away from a thing never to do it again. Prerequisite number two, you have to be baptized in water. Jesus was baptized. You need to be baptized too. Number three, third prerequisite of living under an open heaven, you have to pray. The Bible says, and when Jesus was baptized and praying. So therefore, prayer is a prerequisite of us living under a perpetual open heaven. And number four, which brings us to our point tonight, spiritual maturity. Again, the father pronounced a blessing over the son. This is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Now, Jesus Christ has the right, the rule, and the power and authority to heal the sick, raise the dead, bring sight to the blinded eyes. Why? Because he's come under spiritual maturity. All right. Are you getting this tonight? Did you, are, we, are, we, are we all caught up? Are we all caught up tonight? All right. Let me know if you're all caught up. Are you with me? All right. I got one amen. I got another amen there. We're all caught up. All right, let's go. So tonight, we want to talk about 
this 30 years of silence where Jesus did not do anything. We want to talk about this 30 years of silence that Jesus now walks out in sonship and he shows us living proof and examples on how we are to carry and conduct ourselves as sons of God. Are you with me? Let's talk about those 30 years of silence. When we are born again, in actuality, what has happened to us, we have divinely become perfectly adjusted and aligned to God. When we come into spiritual maturity, it means that we have now become perfectly aligned with God our Father. We have been perfectly aligned with Jesus the Christ, all right? We have been perfectly aligned to become the sons of God. I remind you, as I taught last week, there are two types of sons. First is Greek word, technon. That means a son by birth. So when Jesus Christ came out of the bloody flanks of Mary, he was still a son, a son by birth. But when he was baptized in the Jordan and got up out the water, he now becomes Hebrew word, huas, which means a son who has adopted the very character and nature of the father. Are you with me tonight? So therefore, there is a progression to this thing. Just because you're saved, just because you are a member of somebody's church does not mean you are enjoying an open heaven. So in these 30 years of silence, Jesus Christ himself is becoming perfectly aligned and adjusted to God the Father. All right? When we come to Christ, we come to God, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we are to then now made righteous, not because of our goodness, but because of the holiness and righteousness of God. When we come to God, we are made righteous, but we have not been made holy. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. We have become righteous, but we have not yet become holy. What does that mean, preacher? It means that we are in right standing with God. Stay with me. We are in right standing with God. We are born again. How many thank God tonight that you are born again? You are brand spanking new, a new creature. You are a new species that have never existed before. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But am I finished then? No, I am not finished. I've only just begun. I have not finished. I have only just begun. This process of spiritual maturity to the point that God now looks down from heaven and he releases the Holy Spirit into my life in such magnitude that he speaks out of heaven and calls me his son. Hallelujah, I feel the Holy Ghost already. When he calls me his son, I am ready for the pronouncement of the blessing of living under an open heaven. And the closer I get to God, the more the heavens open. The more spiritual mature, the more spiritually mature I become, the closer I get to living under this open heaven. The closer I get to the Holy Spirit, the closer I get to the Holy Ghost, the closer I get to God, the closer I get to Jesus Christ himself the more the heavens open. 
It's not that I've reached a goal and heaven is just continually open. No, we are all growing in grace. We are all growing in grace. How many thank God that you are growing in grace? The Bible says, let's go there in 2 Corinthians 4 and 16. See what the word says about it. 2 Corinthians 4 and 16. As you continue to come on, for those who are just tuning in, click like and share, tag somebody. I'm going to tell you how to live under an open heaven. Hallelujah. The word says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So there is a process by which I might continually see the heavens open further and further. And the voice becomes clearer and clearer. The voice becomes louder and louder. And the pronouncement becomes stronger and more definite. And time has nothing to do with it. Again, as I remind you in Jewish customs, you had to be 30 years old. But now we're living under grace. Time has absolutely nothing to do with it. Would you like another key tonight? Can I give you another key? You got to stay with me because I'm going somewhere. Can I give you one more key tonight? When we are born again, what happens? That's our first question for today's Bible study. What happens when we are born again? What happens? I'll tell you what happened. We become adjusted perfectly to God. Being born again simply means I am in right standing with God. I'm in the place now where I actually should be. I am now in the place of innocence. You want to write that down. I'm in the place of innocence just like a baby. Never mistake the sovereign works of God in salvation. A lot of us don't understand salvation. We don't understand what it's about. Never mistake the work of God in salvation or sanctification. Never think that it's final. He made the final sacrifice, but the Bible says we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So that lets me know it's a daily thing. They are the beginnings. Salvation, sanctification are the beginnings. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. You want to write this next point down. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? You are not saved and sanctified, watch this, once and for all. Get that in your spirit. Get that in your spirit. I know it don't sit well because a lot of us thought that uh, if we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, be baptized, and we just continue to live in sin, grace will abound. No, it does not work that way. You were not saved and sanctified once and for all. If you get that in your spirit, it's going to help you live right. If you get that in your spirit, you're going to stop hustling and wrestling with holiness and living right. It will help you to live right. You were not saved. You were not sanctified once and for all. You are saved and sanctified once and for always. Somebody got that. You were saved and sanctified once and for always. Say it with me, everybody, put it in the comments. I am not saved once and for all. I'm saved once and for always. You're gonna catch it in a minute. It may sound like an oxymoron, but you will catch it. I am not saved once and for all. I am saved once 
and for always. In other words, you are not positioned for this walk of maturity as some prize you are waiting for or are going to get after graduating. No, the end goal of salvation, the end goal of being born again. Thank you, Zynga, for putting that in the comments and getting involved in the Bible study. Thank you so much. All right. I want you to write this down. The end goal is that number one, once we come into spiritual maturity, once we come into salvation, we become partakers of the divine nature. Of whose divine nature? Jesus' divine nature. We become partakers. Partakers. You become partakers. You living in your one bedroom apartment, you are a partaker. You going back and forth to work every day of the week, you are a partaker. You, the one that people despise, the one that people smile in your face and all the time they want to take your place, you are still a partaker. You, the one who have trials and tribulations and sleepless nights sometimes, you are a partaker of his divine nature. Are you with me? You are a partaker of his divine nature. You are. And that's enough to give God praise for. And number two, we encourage ourselves or we are encouraged to build up ourselves in faith. That's how you stay saved. That's how you stay on the road to spiritual maturity is building up your faith. Go with me to Jude chapter 20. Jude, chap uh, Jude one chapter in Jude, verse 20. Jude, verse 20. The word says this, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on what? Your most holy faith. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Say this with me. Say build. I want everybody just to type that in the comments. Everybody, type that in the comments. All deem good to see you. Everybody type build or faith builds. Put that in the comments. Everybody that will tonight help me in this Bible study, put that in the comment. Faith builds. Come on now. Faith builds up. What is faith? Now faith is the substance of things what hope for and the evidence of things not seen. So therefore, regardless if you see it or not, you believe God that you are saved. You believe God on this saving faith. I'm not talking about believing God for things. You believe God that you've escaped hell when you came to him and accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Faith builds. That's right, Myra. Faith builds up. Faith will build you up. You eventually grow up or mature into him in all things who is the head, even Christ. So his nature, stay with me, I'm going somewhere. I know I've said a lot. His nature becomes formed in you. So you become a son of God. Again, he's giving you the power to become a son of God. You cannot become until first you be. So when you actually be, 
When you accept him as your Lord and Savior, that's the first step. You become a son of God when he now transmogrifies your body and your mind that you are doing the things of God. His nature becomes formed in you. So you become a son of God. Stay with me now. So I want everybody in this room to stop trying to become a man of God before you become a son of God. Stop trying to become a man or a woman of God until first you have become a son of God. Did you catch that tonight? Stop trying to walk out and callings and anointings that you know God really hadn't called you to. Somebody told you that you had a good preaching voice, so you decided to start preaching. Somebody told you that you were good at witnessing to people, and instead of just witnessing to people from your heart, you had to become an evangelist. So stop trying to become a man or a woman of God until first you have become a son of God. Is that not right? All right, I got another, I got a freak for you. As I said last week, remember that song that Sheik put out uh, back there in the 70s and the 80s? They said, all oh, freak out. So I got another freak for you tonight. This is going to blow your mind. This is going to blow your mind. Are you ready? I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Go there with me. Why is he going way back to the book of beginnings? Why is he going back to the birth shite? Why is he going back to the, birth, the, the beginning of, 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 of the earth? Why? I'm going to tell you why. Stay with me. Genesis 1 and 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. So God has created the original Adam, right? Did you get that? God is creating the original Adam. He said, let us make man in our image. So therefore, would we agree that here God is creating the original Adam, the original son of God? You missed it. The original son of God was Adam. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have what? Come on now, saints. Come on in. Let them have what? dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. Stay with me. Don't let your mind wander. In the image of God created he him. Singular, male and female created he them. So let me ask you a question. And I want you all to answer yes or no. Did Adam have dominion over the eagles? When God created Adam in his own image, did he have dominion over the eagles? This is Bible study, so I want you to participate. Did he? Come on, it's not a trick question. I'm not trying to trick you up. I'm going somewhere. Did he have dominion over the eagles? Yes or no? Answer it. Did he have dominion over the whales? Did he have dominion over turtles? Huh? Did he? Yes. Okay, Zynga's not afraid to answer. Aldine says yes. Yes, he did. Yeah, he did. 
Did he have dominion over a bob white quail? Did he have dominion over a white tailed deer? Did he have dominion over a cock a doodling rooster? Did he? Did he have dominion over all the earth? Zynga says over every creature. Now here's the question. Don't let this question trick you. Did he have dominion over every single thing on the earth? Did he have dominion over every single thing on the earth? Some of us would say yes, but the answer is no. Adam did not have dominion over every single thing on the earth. No, there was one thing that he did not have dominion over. Anybody know what that one thing is? Anybody know what that one thing that God did not give him dominion over? Anybody know? There was one thing that he didn't have, to have dominion over. He did not have dominion over himself. Well, that, that, that's true too, Aldine. But he did not have dominion over himself. Man did not have dominion over himself. You, as much power and authority that God has given you in the kingdom, in this dispensation of the gospel, you do not have dominion over yourself. You have no right to yourself. Once you come to Christ, you have no dominion over yourself. When I saw that, when I saw that revelation knowledge, when I saw that revelation knowledge in the scripture, I had to repent. How in the world could I have never seen that in the scripture? Some of you didn't see it until today, until right now. And that's all right. Doesn't mean that we are poor biblical uh, stewards. No, God's giving you revelation knowledge to empower you today to become the sons of God. He's given you revelation knowledge, things that you've read year after year. You're getting a brand new revelation knowledge of it tonight. And that's empowering you to become a son. You can take your place as a believer. You can stomp your foot and announce your dominion over everything. But your problem is what you spend most of your time having dominion over, God never said that it belonged to you. You have no right to yourself. Not in what you wear, not in what you eat, not in what you drink, not in what you say, not in what you do, not in where you go, not in who and what you are. You have no right to you, not who you are going to marry, not how many children you're going to have, so you think you do, not to what you will and will not do, not to where you will work and you will not work, not to when you will show up to work and when you don't, not to how you were 
uh, 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 blessed with the hairs on your head. You have no right to you. Why? When he died on the cross, he purchased you. You have no rights to your thoughts. That's why the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus also. Why ain't y'all saying nothing? Y'all ain't saying, y'all ain't getting excited tonight. I made somebody mad. There you go, Zinger. that's right. All to Jesus, I surrender. When you get to that point, as what Sister Zinga just said, that's when God can use you. You have no right to your thoughts. That's why the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible says, in him we live. I know I'm teaching good tonight. In him we move. In him we what? Have our being. Go with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. Go with me quickly. Write it down if you can't turn there fast enough. I'm trying to teach you how to live under an open heaven. I'm trying to teach you how to do it. You're going to get it. You have no rights to your thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We don't even have the right to decide if we're going home at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock. No. All things are in God's hand. Let me move forward so we can get a better understanding. Go back to Genesis 1, 28. We're still talking about living under an open heaven. We're still talking about that. Genesis 1, 28. Here we go. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea. over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth, every little thing that moveth upon the earth. Adam had dominion over everything but himself. Prove me wrong and I'll resign preaching tonight. Adam had dominion over everything but himself. God was to, was to have absolute dominion over Adam. Adam had the responsibility in his own maturing, which was to be accomplished by the word of God or God's voice or his word, not Adam's own reasoning. So how do I mature? How do I grow? How do I enjoy these things of this open heaven? How do I mature and grow? When you are born again, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is birthed, watch me now, into your human nature. When you are born again, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is birthed into your human nature. Your human nature must be transformed by the indwelling life of the Holy Ghost. You have been given now the power to sacrifice your natural life or the natural way of living. You've been given the power and the resources to do that. Without God, you can't. Without God, you cannot come out of fornication. 
Without God, you can't put the drugs down. Without God, you can't come out of lies and malice. Without God, you cannot come out of witchcraft. Without God, you cannot come out of the things that are not pleasing in his sight. So when you have God, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, that's why the Bible says the Holy Ghost will teach us in all things. You now have been given the power to sacrifice your natural life or the natural way of living to the will of God. That's all. That's all we've been given. Authority or the power to do it in ourselves is to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Are you getting this tonight? I have been given the power to put things down. I have been given the power to put away the natural way of living and sacrifice it with the will of God through obedience. That's why the word says obedience is better than sacrifice. Are you getting this tonight now? Are you getting it now? And through this process, we mature and become the sons of God. Through this process, it doesn't, not based on a timeline. That's why that some folks, there are some folks that are spiritually mature at 17 years old. And some of us has been in church for 50 years and we have not even began to reach spiritual maturity. We are spiritual adolescents at 50, 60 and 70 years old and much less spiritually mature than some young folks. So it has nothing to do with your age. It has everything to do with your obedience. You can recognize a spiritually immature person. You can easily recognize a spiritual immature person. How can you recognize a spiritually immature person? They're always the ones needing someone to feed them. They're always the one needing someone to feed them, to change their spiritual diapers, to clean up their spiritual boo-boo. I know that sounds humorous, but it's true. To clean up their spiritual mess. They whine a lot. And the only way they know how to communicate is crying. Why? Why? Only way they know how to communicate is to whine, murmur, and complain. They have not learned how to use words at 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. But they complain about the sun. They complain about the rain. They complain about everything. They are spiritually immature. You have been given the power. Are you with me tonight? To sacrifice your natural life. You have been given the power to sacrifice your natural life to the will of God. And every thing that you do outside of that is contrary to the spirit. You have the power to sacrifice your natural life to the will of God. The contrary to that is spiritual insubordination. Not bringing yourself to the obedience of Christ is spiritual in subordination. And here's what the devil said to Adam and Eve. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Here's what the devil said to Adam and Eve. First to Eve and then to Adam. What did he say? Let's go there. Let's go there. Go to Genesis 3 and 1. Genesis 3 and 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast. He was a smooth operator. 
He was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, why does he approach the woman first? Because she is the life giver. She is the seed holder. He said unto the woman, yea, have God said, did God really say that you should not eat of the tree of the garden? Look at this old rascal. Have not God said. So what is he aiming at? He's aiming at God's dominion over Adam. Through the woman. Now causing him to question God and God's authority and dominion over his life. Have not God said. Then he continues in the fourth verse. Go to the fourth verse. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall become open. Then your eyes shall become open and ye shall be as God's small g knowing good and evil. In other words, Adam, you become God over yourself. The fruit in the garden was not an apple. It was a thought. The fruit was a thought. So now, Adam, you don't need God. You are God yourself. Are y'all getting this? This is good to me tonight. Do y'all want another? Can I, can I freak you out one more time? Can I give you another valid point? Can you handle it tonight? Can you handle it? Can you handle the things of God? Can you handle spiritual maturity? Can you handle the word? So let's see if we can handle it. Question for you. What is sin? What is sin? I'll wait. I wish I had that, that, uh, the music from that thing, from that, uh, game show. Down, 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 down. I will play that while I wait for your answer. You can handle this? All right. What is sin? Anybody have a definition to what is sin? I'm going to tell you what is sin. Think fast now. I should go around the room and ask each everyone that's in this Bible said, but I won't do that. Can you name a sin? Anything that you can name is the wrong answer. Sin is not looking at pornography. Sin is not fornication or adultery. Sin is not getting drunk off a couple 40s of Old English or Mad Dog 2020, Jack Daniels or Seagram's, whatever you drink. Those are the effects of sin. Those are the attributes or the functions or the functionality of sin manifesting, but those are not the sin. It is simply the outgrowth, if you will, of sin. It is the effect of sin, but it's not, quote, the sin. I'm going to tell you what the sin is. Write this down. If you don't get nothing else tonight, get this. The sin is my claim to my right to myself. That's what the sin is. My claim to my right to myself. That's why you get drunk and smoke weed because you want to. And ain't nobody 
old enough or big and bad to tell you what you can and can't do because you're grown. I'm grown. I'm grown. You can't tell me what to do. I'm grown. There you go, Zinga. Sin is transgression against God for anything that is not of God. My right, my claim to my right to myself. That's why you look at the filthiness on the internet because you want to and you can. That's why some men slap their wives and beat their wives and got her all punked out and afraid to say anything to him because it's what he wanted to do. That's why you didn't pay your tithe because you didn't want to. That's why you rebelled against your parents when you were a child because you wanted to. That's why you left your husband for another man because you wanted to. Ain't nobody pushed you into the arms of another man. The devil is a lie. You made a choice to sin. That's why you went and gambled away your family savings because you wanted to. My claim to my right to myself. I'm old enough to do it. And because I want to be happy, I have the right to make myself happy. I have the right to get what I want to get. Because I, you know, I'm, I'm into this self-care now. And self-care says I can get what I want when I want it. I'm going to take care of me because I'm grown. Your problem is you think that you're in control of the difference between good and evil. You think that those things are going to make you happy. But in reality, you're trying to replace God with things that make you feel good. That's why you wear the clothes the way you wear them, because you want to. That's why you still go to clubs, shake your wang dang doodle, shake your shimmy, because you want to. My claim to my right to myself is the root of every act or expression of sin, because God never gave you dominion over yourself. Are you with me tonight? What do y'all want me to do? You want me to make you smile tonight? You want me to tell a few jokes to make you feel better? Or do you want the truth? Do you want the truth? Or you want me to just tickle your fancy and tell you there's a check in the mailbox? I can do that. Or do you want the real truth? What do you want? Do you want entertainment? Or do you want to be superimposed by the Holy Ghost to enjoy this open heaven? I don't think so. I'm not going to sit here and tickle your fancy tonight. It's time for us to mature. It's time for us to grow up in the things of God. It's time for us to mature in the things of God. It's time for us to be what God has called us to be. Amen? Do you understand why I'm trying to take you tonight? I'm not being mean. I'm not, you know, being disrespectful. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings or none of that stuff. Do you understand where I'm trying to go with this tonight? I'm trying to take you to your next level. Somebody in here in this Bible study is sick of church simulac. They are sick of pablum. They are sick of church baby formula. They are sick of sweet milk and Cairo syrup. For those old school like me, when mama couldn't, couldn't buy a uh, formula, they would get that sweet milk and Cairo syrup and feed it to the babies. Y'all don't know nothing about that. Are you ready for some true meat of the word? Watch this now. We're almost done. Watch this. If I'm God's son, I give up my right 
to my claim to myself. If you are God's son and that's genderless, you give up your right to my claim to myself. Okay? In Luke 3, 23, don't turn there. We talked about it last week. Jesus is now 30 years old. He's now spiritually mature according to Jewish customs, but in obedience to the will of God. It really didn't have anything to do with his age. It has to do everything with his obedience to God. When we do what we want in our natural life, it always leads to immorality. When you do what you're big and bad enough to do, it will always lead into immorality, which would lead to a closed heaven. From laziness to slothfulness to working an honest day's work for an honest day's ways, wage to whatever we do that is contrary to the divine will of God and the edict of God that is expressed in his word, it will eventually and most certainly without reservation, it will lead you to immorality. If you are lazy at work, you're lazy, you'll be lazy in your family. If you're lazy with your family, you're going to be lazy with your relationship with your wife or your husband. If you're lazy with your relationship with your spouse, some Coca-Cola shaped woman will come batting her eyes at you and your mouth is going to start watering. Some muscle bound man will come and flex his muscles to you and your mouth will start watering and you'll go that way because after all is what you want to do. Nobody made you do anything. When we do what God wants us to do, it will always lead to growth. It will always lead to grace. It will always lead to an open heaven. Do we agree? I know the son, the word says, whom the son set free is free indeed, but freedom is not the absence of the law. Freedom is the empowerment to keep the law. Freedom is the empowerment to keep the things of God. All right. Everybody in America says two things. They always say, number one, we are the land of the free and the home of the brave. Number two, they say that we that we are a nation of laws. So how would we think that freedom is absence of law or guidelines? In other words, I can do what I want because there is no law that restricts me from doing what I want to do in the kingdom so I can just do what I want. In the kingdom, I'm free. Whom the son sets free is free indeed. Oh, I, I, I got liberated so I can live any kind of way I want because God's going to forgive me. No, you are free to choose. Now, here's the whole thing in a nutshell. I'm almost done, I promise you. I'm trying to finish this tonight so we can go to the next lesson tomorrow. When we are born again, we enter into innocence, right? I just proved that to you. When a child is born, when you had a baby, all those mothers that's watching tonight, when you had a baby, could you accuse that baby of any crime? No, because it's broken no law. It's innocent. It has no ability to choose right from wrong. It's therefore innocent. When I am born again, here's the key. When I am born again, I return to that created state. I am redeemed, bought with the price. Okay, real quickly, go to uh, Galatians 3 and 13. Galatians 3 and 13. Galatians 3 and 13. Is this good tonight? Can y'all stand a little bit more? Just a little bit more. Galatians 3 and 13. I'm still telling you how to live under an open heaven. It says this. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse 
for us. Being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Fourteen verse, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. There's that word again. That we may receive the promise through faith. This is good. What am I saying? What am I saying? I'll tell you this. This is what I'm saying. I am returned when I am born again. I am returned and redeemed. I'm returned to the original state of affairs as Adam was. Help me, Holy Ghost. As Adam was, so am I. The moment that I am born again, I return to that state of innocence. The slate is wiped clean. Do you remember that Adam and Eve didn't need any clothing? It was only after they sinned, only after my claim to my right to myself that they ever needed clothing. They were innocent. To become mature, we must do as Jesus did, do our best to live holy. All right? What is innocence? Let me see how far I have to go here. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I know this is a long lesson. What is innocence? Innocence is the untried possibility of holiness. That's what innocent is. It's the untried possibility of holiness. I don't know if you are holy or not because in your innocence, you are untried. What makes you holy is when you are faced with trials and tribulations and temptations and you turn away from it. That's why he placed a tree in the middle of the garden in the first place and said, don't you eat from that tree. He had to try their innocence. He had to try their innocence and see if they would make the right moral choice. And through that right moral choice, they become holy. Are y'all getting this tonight? This is good. This is good. This is good. Through a consistent presentation of temptation to live the natural life through the natural way, I have a continuum and an ongoing day-by-day -day process of trying my innocence. And through a moral decision, turning innocence to holiness. Most of us in here today, in the time, we're in the time of high technology, we are daily confronted with Computers, we are daily confronted with sin and we make more decisions every day based on the word of God and his command on what we should and shouldn't do. If I choose my way, that's going to produce immorality and separate me further from holiness and close the heavens over my life. Do you know what holiness is? Holiness is power to become sons of God. God is absolutely powerful for the express reason that he is a holy God. He's absolutely holy. That's why he's absolutely powerful. He's absolutely holy. He's absolutely pure. Therefore, he is absolutely powerful. Are you with me? If you take crude oil and refine it enough, you get kerosene. 
If you take kerosene and refine it more, a little bit more, and get rid of the impurities, you then get gasoline. But it came from the same source. If you take gasoline and refine it more and get rid of the impurities, you get jet fuel. Gasoline burns hotter than kerosene, but it came from the same source. Jet fuel burns hotter than gasoline. Why? Because you continue to extract the impurities, and as the impurities are extracted, that thing becomes pure. That thing becomes holy. It becomes pure. The more holy or pure it is, the more power it has. The more holy and pure it is, the more power it has. I see my cousin on there. Hey, Dee Dee, good to see you. Love you. The more power it has. So as I am confronted daily with the expressions of sin, God does not confront me. Here's the key now. God does not confront me with evil to tempt me. No, he doesn't do that. But he confronts me with stuff to prove me. Have you ever, Satan, have you considered my servant Tim Woodson, I know you considered Joe, but have you considered my servant, Tim? Have you considered my servant, Dee Dee? Have you considered my servant, Aldine? Have you considered my servant, Myra, Satan? Have you considered my servant, Zynga? Have you considered my servants? Have you considered my servant Diana? Have you considered my servant Sam? Have you considered my servant Dwight, Satan? Have you considered him? I want you to put them into the test. Put it up in front of them. Go ahead, put it up in front of Tim, Satan. Let her come with her Coca-Cola shaped body and bat her eyelashes. and shake her shimmy. And every time Tim chooses my word, I'm going to purify him to become my son. And I'm going to open up the heavens over his life. And I'm going to pronounce a blessing over him. We transform innocence to holiness, and I'm coming to a close, seriously, by a series of moral choices. What an open heaven, what a jubilee. Jubilee comes in Luke chapter four, and I want you to turn there, uh, just write it down. Luke chapter four, part B of, of that chapter before jubilee is Luke chapter four, part A. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. You know the rest of the story. And Satan presented himself to the Lord and answered, it is written. He presented himself to the Lord and the Lord answered, it is written. Moral choice. Second time, he feels stronger now. He says, it is written. He feels more powerful, Jesus does. Third time, temptation. Go ahead and throw yourself off this cliff and, you know, God will rescue you. He says, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now he's ready to come out of a proven walk. Stay with me. He's ready to come out of a proven walk into and be transmogrified into a devil slayer. He returns to Galilee in the power of the spirit. And he announces to the synagogue, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. 
What are you saying, Pastor Tim? Tomorrow, saints of God, you will be faced with a thousand moral choices. Will I tell the truth or will I skirt the truth and tell a little white lie? Will I let my boss think that I'm at work and have my coworkers cover for me? Will I be late to work tomorrow and have somebody to punch me in? Or will I be moral? Will I give the girl at the checkout line at Walmart a 10 and she makes a mistake and gives me a 20, gives me change for a 20? Will I give her the money back? Or will I fail that test and put that money in my pocket? Will I get somewhere with my so-called girlfriend or my boyfriend, women, and pet? I'm keeping it holy. You know what I mean when I say pet. And do ungodly things and still claim to be a virgin just because you didn't go all the way. Read between the lines. You didn't go all the way to third base. Or will I make a moral choice and tell that man, take your hands off of me. I've got the Holy Ghost. I'm saved. Or men tell that woman, no, I can't go there with you. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify. And ever dying soul to save, fitted for the sky. Will I respond in anger? I'm trying to tell you how to get an open heaven. Just because somebody told me something that I didn't like. But will I hold my tongue behind the ivory bars of my mouth and be slow to speak and slow to anger? Will I complain? Will I murmur? Criticize and backbite and fuss to make my point and ridicule? Or will I open my mouth and bless people? In my closing, let me tell you a true story. This is my closing. I was uh, driving down the road with my family. I was married at the time. Uh, years ago, I was driving down the road with my family and somebody made me so mad uh, that I could have jumped out the car. And if I was in two feet of them, they cut me off. And if I had gotten within two feet of them, I would have got my blade out that I kept under my seat. This is years ago. And went to slicing. I just left the dentist office, got all four wisdom tooth teeth pulled all at once. Here I am full of prescription painkillers. I had no business driving in the first place, but I'm stubborn like that. Used to be. The joker pulled out in front of me and liked to ran me and my family off the road. Both cars going about 50 to 60 miles an hour. Here I am driving, trying to get out of the car while the car was moving. How dumb is that? I'm hollering and screaming. I got my children in the car. They were small then. And I start cussing. Now, yeah, preaching, I did. You so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. And those that are closest to me, my cousins on here, but those who are closest to me, uh, uh, you know, they have a name that I call people when I get mad. It's not a cuss word. This word is in the Bible, but I use it in the wrong connotation. And I was trying my best to catch this joker. I was doing my best to catch him at that next stoplight. I was going to get out and give him the business. I was going to try. And after I got through fussing and spitting and cussing, the Spirit said to me, stop, pray. Pray for those who despitefully use you. I know he was wrong, just pray. And I'm telling you, they were wrong as two left shoes, could have took our lives. They were wrong as rain on the 4th of July. <laughs> they were just playing out wrong. And God said, I know they were wrong. 
but you are faced now with a moral choice. A moral choice. Let us grow into maturity, saints of God. Let us walk in the nature and character of God. Let us continue to see his hands force open the windows of heaven by our thousand upon thousand moral choices that we will make tomorrow produce that holiness in us, not immorality, that will open up the windows of heaven, that we will be poured out this blessing that we will not have room enough to receive. I am weary. I'm tired. I've poured out everything tonight. I've given you my best. I hope you enjoy the lesson tonight. I hope you enjoy the lesson. Hallelujah. All right. Did you enjoy the lesson? God bless you. Thank you all. Uh, that, that's right, uh, cuz. That was wrong. <laughs> that was dead wrong, cuz. That was wrong, but it happened. But I was wrong for going there and letting someone control me. I could not control the situation, so why let it control you? You can't control the situations that happen in your life, so why you let it control? Why are you letting it control you? Cause you to make a bad choice. Now, the more bad choices you make, the more the heavens are closed over your life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless your hearts. We thank God for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for the opportunity, Father, to just rightly divide the word of truth. God, we're asking that you would show us how to continue to live under an open heaven. Show us what to do, what not to do. Father, we get rid of my claim to my right to myself. We realize the only thing that you gave dominion, you gave us dominion over everything in the earth, but you did not give, give us dominion over ourselves. You have that dominion. You have that power. So we submit wholly to you right now. In the name of Jesus, we thank you right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God and amen. All right, good. God bless you. We are going to let you go. It is given time in the sanctuary. I want everybody to. Uh, get your best seed offering in your hand. Everybody get the best seed offering that you can. That's right, cousin. Never let someone take you where you don't want to go. That's right, because you give them the control. That is so true. Thank you, cousin. I appreciate that. All right. I want everybody to get your best seed offering. We're going to give in the sanctuary tonight. Whether you're at home, whether you're in your car, at work, this is the sanctuary. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Ghost. So we are actually in the sanctuary everywhere we go, uh, not just on Tuesday or Wednesday or Sunday morning. We live, move, and have our being in God's sanctuary. So I want everybody to get your best seed offering. If you don't have a church home and you're wanting to tie uh, to this church, you can do that. The information is on the screen. Everybody, again, as I teach every week, don't just consume, contribute. Get your best seat offering and give. You can give by cash app at dollar sign LTC ATL. Dollar sign LTC ATL. All right. You can give at dollar sign LTC ATL. Do that. All right. If you uh, wanted to use your credit card and, and give uh, via your credit card, you can do that by texting the word give, texting the word give to 678-250-0771, 678-250-0771. You can use your credit card to give your seeds. If you don't have seed in the ground, you will not have a harvest. If you have not followed us on Facebook, do that right now. After you've given, follow us on Facebook at LTC ATL. In the search bar of Facebook, just type in the letter, the, the at sign and LTC ATL, and we will come up on your screen. Hit like and follow us, okay? Do that, all right? As you continue to give on next week, we're going to continue 
uh, in our lesson uh, next week. I think we're going to have one more lesson of this open heaven. And I hope you all have uh, uh, gotten something uh, out of the lessons we've been teaching you. All right. So next week, we're going to continue in on this lesson. I'm just looking at my my notes and uh, we're going to talk about again uh, the seven uh, covenant blessings of sonship. And that'll be our final part of the Open Heaven series. OK, right. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord. Uh, and for those who missed the bulk of this lesson. Uh, for those that missed the bulk of this lesson, Pastor, you can send the number in the chat, please. I sure will. I will send the number in the chat uh, for you. Definitely will. Uh, uh, again, 678-250-0771. But I will definitely uh, text it to you. Uh, for those who missed the broadcast, it'll be re-aired on Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Eastern. 6 a.m. Central, all right? Tuesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. And on Wednesday morning, 7 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Central, all right? God bless you. Pray much for me, amen, as I continue to do the work and will of the Lord. I want you to go now in peace. I want you to remember that God loves you, and so do I. And always remember this, as I say every week, God is fighting for you. And this time, I promise you, you will not lose. Go now in peace. I love you in Jesus' name.